Thank you for participating today. We invite you to become engaged in Penn Ohio and partners like Tri-C and the Mandel Center. Together, we can support world-class writers here in Ohio. Hello everyone, and welcome to another Penn Ohio training video. I am Mike Fegis from Hudson Middle School, and today I'm going to tell you about several grammatical constructions that bring creative writing to life. Using the five techniques presented in this video will make good writing great and will make great writing outstanding. These are time-worn and tested techniques that all best-selling authors use in the novels they write. I learned about these techniques from my friend, colleague, mentor, and well-known writing guru, Harry Noden. Mr. Noden introduced me to these techniques years ago, and they appear in his wonderful book, Image Grammar, Teaching Grammar as Part of the Writing Process. The techniques are known by a couple of different names. The term Mr. Noden taught me was brushstrokes. He used this term because authors use these techniques in exactly the same way that an artist would use a brush dipped in paint on a blank canvas. Every time an artist sweeps the bristles of a paint-covered brush across a canvas, the brush leaves two things behind, color and texture. Without color and texture, there is no painting. If writers don't add color and texture to their pieces, readers will be left with a blank white canvas in their minds. So let's start painting with words, shall we? To begin with, we must start with a simple sentence that I will refer to as a core sentence. When we add our brush strokes, the structure of the core sentence itself won't change. We will attach our brush strokes to the core sentence using commas. It's commas, surprisingly, that help give these brush strokes their power. By attaching phrases to core sentences with a comma, we slow the reader down and make her pause for just an extra beat. We alter the flow of the sentence and create a new rhythm. You will see that brush strokes not only help you to add sensory details effectively, but they also create an almost musical quality to writing that readers find very appealing. The core sentence that we will be improving with brush strokes is, the children played. This is about as simple as a sentence can get. It's got a subject and it's got a verb. Let's see if we can't make this sentence a bit more interesting using brush strokes. The first brush stroke is called the ing participle. To create this brushstroke, you need to add a phrase beginning with an ing verb to the main sentence. ing participles can appear at the beginning or the end of a course sentence. Let's try it in both places. Screaming at the top of their lungs, the children played. Notice how we have added a sensory detail to this rather dull course sentence. We not only know that the children are playing, we know they are doing it in a very loud fashion. Let's remove that brush stroke and place a different one at the end of the core sentence to see if we can focus on a different aspect of the scene. The children played, charging after one another in a heated game of tag. In this revised sentence, we have appealed to the sense of sight rather than sound. We can picture the children darting back and forth as the person who is it tries to pass the honor on to someone else. An ing participle can also be placed in the middle of a sentence to draw more attention to the phrase. The children, sweating beneath the midday sun, played. In these three short examples, we have addressed three different senses, sound, sight, and feeling. Notice also the cadence of the brushstroke improved sentence. There are pauses that make the passage more complex, more interesting to the ear. And this is only the first brushstroke. Imagine what these techniques can do when they are used effectively. Take a look at a few examples of ING participles from the novel Redwall by Brian Jakes. The second brushstroke is called Begin with a Prepositional Phrase. I like to think that the title is pretty self-explanatory. 
you simply add a prepositional phrase or two to the beginning of a sentence. Attach those phrases with commas, just like you did with the ing participles. Let's grab our little core sentence again. The children played. Prepositional phrases can be simple or more complex. The more creative you get with them, the more varied your results will be. Let's start with something simple. In the empty street, the children played. We have added a solid visual sensory detail. It's still a basic sentence, but it's more interesting than the one we started with. Now, let's spice it up even more. Under a thickening blanket of storm clouds, the children played. Here, we not only added a visual detail, but the words we've chosen have created a mood, too. The ominous blanket of clouds puts the reader on edge. We hope that those kids are smart enough to take cover before the storm begins. Let's lighten the mood with a different prep phrase. Near a crystal clear stream amid a sea of wildflowers, the children played. We just did a total 180. Now we don't want those kids to ever leave that lovely glade. The begin with a prepositional phrase brushstroke is often overlooked by writers, but it's a powerful one that, when used to its maximum effect, can have a wonderful impact on a passage. Let's look at a few examples of begin with prep phrase brushstrokes from Laura Hillenbrand's novel Seabiscuit. Moving right along, brushstroke number three is called the appositive. An appositive is a noun that renames another noun in a sentence, making it more specific. This brushstroke is an amplifier, or an intensifier. Now, where did those playing children go? Oh, here they are. The children played. Since an appositive renames a noun, we have only one place where this brushstroke can go in this particular sentence. The children a hypergroup of eight-year-olds played. We have renamed the nonspecific noun children as a group of hyper eight-year-olds. The image has come clearer thanks to our brushstroke. Let's remove that brushstroke and add a different one to paint a completely different image. The children, refugees from a nearby camp, played. Notice how the scene changes when a word like refugees is the renaming noun. There is all sorts of mental baggage that comes with that word, a whole host of images that the reader automatically adds to the scene without being told to do so. The appositives in the following examples come from John Grisham's novel, The Last Juror. brushstroke is a little tricky since it looks like an appositive. It is also set off by commas in exactly the same way that an appositive is. This one is called adjectives out of order. In the normal flow of a sentence, adjectives appear before the nouns they modify. The red rusty wagon sat in the yard. That sentence is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But when the adjectives are shifted out of order and are set off with commas, the cadence of the sentence changes, and now those simple adjectives stand out in a way that they did not before. The power of the description is amplified. The wagon, red and rusty, sat in the yard. In its simplest construction, this brushstroke appears in the form of two adjectives joined with the word and, just like the example. Let's bring our core sentence back and see if we can't spruce it up with an adjectives out of order brushstroke. The children played. 
The children, dirty and sweaty, played. Sometimes the adjectives are surrounded by more words that help to paint even more detail into the scene. Let's take those first two adjectives and add a few more descriptive words to them so that we have a full adjective phrase. The children, smeared with dirt from the baseball field and sweaty beneath a late August sun, played. The difference between the original sentence and the improved one is dramatic. The following are examples of adjectives out of order from the book The Stories of Ray Bradbury by, you guessed it, Ray Bradbury. The fifth and last brush stroke that I'm going to talk about is the toughest one for many writers to create. It's called the absolute phrase. The main part of this brush stroke is formed by pairing a noun with an ing verb. It's often known as a blank blanking. The absolute phrase amplifies the action in a sentence. Here come those children and they're playing again. Let's see if we can add an absolute to make their frolicking come clearer. The children played. The children, voices echoing across the playground, played. I wanted to revise this sentence but chose not to so that you could see my process. I used the word play twice within two words. I could leave it as is but it creates a repetition that I don't particularly care for. I'm going to revise it. The children, voices echoing in the school's courtyard, played. Much better. This brushstroke can be used in different places within the sentence, too. The children played, voices echoing in the school's courtyard. Voices echoing in the school's courtyard, the children played. The decision of where to place the brushstroke is up to you. Here are some examples of absolute phrases from Robert Jordan's novel, The Eye of the World. <music> Finally, we arrive at the most magical part of using brush strokes, combining them. Try mixing and matching the techniques to see what you can create. The following multiple brush stroke sentences come from George R. R. Martin's novel, A Clash of Kings. There are a few main pitfalls to avoid when using brush strokes. First, avoid cliches. Absolute phrases like heart pounding, sweat dripping, lungs heaving, and blood pumping are the most common absolutes and therefore are the least effective. Strive for new combinations of words. Next, having said that creativity is good, Make sure that the brush strokes that you create make sense and enhance the passages they are added to. 
A poorly worded brushstroke is often worse than having no enhancement at all. While the following examples are grammatically correct, the images they create are rather disastrous. Legs sprinting, the runner dashed down the track. It sounds like the legs are sprinting off by themselves. Take a look at this one too. Brain thinking, the student slaved over the test. Yes, your brain does your thinking, so this is a rather obvious absolute. The sentence is no better than it was before the brush stroke was added, and I would say that the sentence is actually worse after the enhancement. Always remember the salt and french fry analogy. A little salt on your french fries is a good thing. It adds just a little flavor to the potatoes that makes the entire experience more enjoyable. But if you dump an entire container of salt on your fries, burying the poor things beneath an avalanche of white crystals, the bitterness will ruin the experience completely. The same kind of bitterness occurs in writing when too many brush strokes smother the passages. Which leads me to my last point. Add brush strokes strategically. A brush stroke in every sentence is most definitely overkill. Pick your spots carefully. When you have an important action scene or are introducing a new character, brush strokes can paint a lot of specific detail in an efficient manner. Just remember that too much of a good thing can definitely be a bad thing. And that's it for this training module. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the magic of the brush strokes. As always, thanks for watching and happy writing.